but there can be an outcome. You know, what would that look like? This map that Ms. Qualls puts up that shows, you know, how these centers can come up with creative places of activity. You have to have people who are willing to kind of let those purse strings go. And if I had, if I had a magic wand, I basically would put that power and that responsibility on the people who live in those areas to come up with something that works and make sure that it fits in this greater plan for Detroit and then execute it. Because then you'll do another thing. You'll help them to see how difficult it really is to come up with a master plan and then execute it. But that it also empowers them to, to take more seriously their role in this process. And it, it, it lets me as a resident say, you know, my city does care about what's going on on my block, and I don't have to make a weekly call to somebody who's just going to log it. They are going to provide me with the resources to make that happen, whether that's through my block club or it's a community CDC. But getting those resources into to the neighborhoods, I think, is really going to be key. Gary Brown. Yeah, I, I, I agree with all of that. Um, there, there, there are a couple points. Um, I, I think we have to get over uh, this number that we attach ourselves to with regards to Detroit's population. Detroit's going to continue to lose population probably for the next three to five years. And I, I know that my mayor is, is hanging his hat on the fact that he's going he's gonna to grow the population. But, you know, in my opinion, until we fix some things, uh, fix some city services, make sure that uh, public safety and education is taken care of. You're going you're gonna to continue to lose population, which means you don't really have the tax base to support a city that's 138 square miles. And that's okay. You, you can have a great city with 500,000 people. There are cities around this country, Charlotte, they don't even have that, but they're managed well. It's how well we manage the city that matters, not the number, but in America, when you're not growing, you're not getting better, you're not seen as a success. I say, forget the number, don't get hung up on what the number is, manage the city well and people will uh, come back and start to, to grow our neighborhood. Secondly, you, you have to have a regional approach to fixing our problems and we've got some great examples. I mean, Cobo Hall is, is a great example of a regional approach, finding dollars to fix that facility that the city just didn't have. Uh, the grand bargain, uh, the millage for the DIA, uh, the water department that now is uh, hopefully in July will become an authority and will create $50 million a year for 40 years uh, to redo the infrastructure. That's dollars that our tax base just would not have without having that authority. So, you know, the big, the big next authority that we have to fix is regional transportation. I mean, we have to have a regional transportation system to get our people in the city of Detroit to jobs in the suburbs and get all those great suburbanites down to our casinos and to our arenas to spend those tax dollars because it creates jobs and that's what we need. So, you know, get over the, the number that, you know, we're not growing. Let's manage the city well and let's find regional approaches to fixing these problems as opposed to trying to do it all by ourselves. Okay, we've got a lot of really good, very quickly, because we've got so many good yeah. questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I just wanted to, to add to the point about the, the, the tax base and, and there's an element of that, of course, that's residential. Pro uh, residential population base, but we found as we went through our master planning process that that the city of Flint's daytime population is actually growing because we're a regional employment center. So just one of the specifics I would put on the table when you ask, well, what, what specifically could change? Uh, we could uh, eliminate in the state of Michigan the, uh, the suburban resident income tax break. Uh, whereby if you live in the suburbs but work in the city, you pay half the local income tax rate that you do if you actually live in the city. Um, for the city of Flint, that would generate about $7 million a year into the general fund. Again, I said we have about a $50 million general fund, so that's more than a 10% boost. I, I'd imagine for the city of Detroit, it's probably 100 plus million that would come in if you equalize those rates. And, and that, that's, again, just making it equal. Because if you work at DMC, you, you drive the roads, you depend on police, you depend on street lights, but DMC doesn't pay any property taxes and, and non-resident workers only pay half the income tax that those of you who live in the city actually pay. So you could uh, use those revenues for five to seven years to eliminate Detroit's blight problem. And then you, you'd have neighborhoods that were blight free 
it, it is going to take some capacity. That's just one, one piece of food for thought. I mean, let's just eliminate the, the tax disparity uh, on our suburban and urban residents. Uh, again, we don't need to overtax, but let's just make that burden equal because we're employment centers as much as we are residential population centers. So we're going to start with a question uh, for you, Roxanne, about the racial context of what you built in Cincinnati. Was there an issue of race that you had to also address as you were executing this plan? Well, in terms of the comp plan, you mean? Yes. Or the, okay. Well, and I think that that is uh, reflected in the process that we used, which is that uh, recognizing that the city of Cincinnati is a diverse community, the racial composition is uh, basically about 50-50 at this point in terms of majority, uh, minority, and so, um, and there had been some uh, significant uh, racial tension that expressed itself in 2001. And the, the good news is that that was a wake-up call um, to a, a philanthropic community, to the business community, to the civic community. And so part of the planning process and the reason why it really was a significant break from the past by focusing on neighborhoods was a recognition that um, for the city of Cincinnati to have a future, it was going to have to actually look at how to put its money and its and it's wherewithal where its mouth has been. Because all politicians talk about how valuable neighborhoods are, right? Yep, yep, you know, it's like. Um, and the, the, all the speeches are all, sound all, all alike, right? Um, <laughs> right. So even I get bored with them. Um, um, so um, the planning process uh, cast as big of a net as possible, it went out into communities, it used every single resource, it involved people, and it tried to also be sensitive to the fact that, um, that you know, you can actually ha invite people to come in to where you are, but the most important thing is to go out into the communities. And then there was a whole iter iterative process of uh, interaction and a recognition that um, dealing with issues of jobs, and we've heard this already before from panel members, jobs, transportation, the linkages, that those were critical aspects of the plan. So this isn't just a physical plan. It also has to be one that emphasizes equity and connections. Mm -hmm. Khalil, when we're talking about engaging community members in developing a plan that will build the kind of neighborhood they want, what works to, to engage those community members, to bring them into a process that they may not trust? I think you have to first allow that venting process that, that has to happen, especially in a place like Detroit. And, and I'm not saying like months and months of, of venting about all that's wrong, but you do have to allow space for, for people to kind of say what's really on their heart and mind and, and set the table for that, but say, okay, now what? All right, so we've put it all out there. Everything that we can catalog is wrong, but there are many jewels in our communities. And, and I think one of the highlights of, of the community planning process on the east side was just that, look at all these jewels that we do have. I know we've, we've been bombarded just because of what we've experienced for so long, but look what we do have. Now, how do we build off of that? And, and I think those conversations and, and having a, a forum and a place for people to just speak very authentically about what, what they're experiencing and then feeling like they also have some, some power to implement some of the, the, the positives that they envision and see that forward. I think we have to be very deliberate about that. And, I, and I, I think we've heard some really great examples of that happening at a higher level. The, the uniqueness, though, is that most of the community planning that has happened in Detroit in recent years has mostly been led by the community. Only these two examples are, are, are the local leadership kind of taking that on. So, so we've kind of worked in a different approach, but neither is, is, is incorrect. I think what we just have to do is make sure that we have a, a very engaged, 
governing body. So those that are in charge of our city have to be at that table too because the community can get together all they want and come up with all the great ideas in the world. But if they don't have what she calls horsepower and capacity to make that happen, if they don't vote at that city council table, if they don't you know, talk to BCED and, and, and have those kind of relationships, then those ideas and, and plans are just that. They're gonna sit there. So we have to have this kind of cross sector of, of the community, of, of the different uh, civic and development uh, cores. We have to have our government at the table so that we can come up with this idea and figure out together how to move it forward. Mm -hmm. Gary, um, someone asks, Detroit has multiple high profile economic development corporations, DEGC, the Port Authority. How can the expertise and money that supports downtown become part of what they call an intentional organizational framework that builds and equitably sustains neighborhoods? Wow. <laughs> Who asked that question? I don't know. <laughs> I, I should have known it was you. <laughs> I, I, I suspect it. <laughs> you know, we, we, we should have got Tom Lewan or, or one of those Harvard graduates that the mayor's hired for economic development. I'm the operations guy, but... Uh, yeah, you're, I mean, you know, there are more alphabet soups and DEGCs and DD, DDAs and, you know, PBAs and, and I, I don't know how we uh, coordinate all of the, the federal, state, local um, organizations to work as, as one in order to, to get these projects done. But, I, you know, I think it takes leadership and, and the mayor has got a great plan and a great team on the economic development side. It's, it's not my side of the house. I work on the operation side of the house. Um, and so I, I don't know if I have a good answer for you because I really didn't understand the question that thoroughly. But, and so, so I'm going to pass the mic on to one of my colleagues that, <laughs> that, that probably did. Well, Dane, actually, I, I, I think in Flint, I've lived in, in Flint and here in Detroit, and there are a number of organizations that I saw come together in Flint including the foundation community, the university community in Flint. How did you engage them and, and get them to buy not just into what's happening in downtown, but what's happening out in the neighborhoods as well? I do think a, a big part of it does go back to the planning framework, because when that's um, legally adopted and then followed up with the zoning code, that, that's going to set some legally enforceable parameters about what goes where. And, and if you're like we were, you know, seven or eight years ago where we hadn't had a plan for 50 years and our, our zoning code was just as old, then it, it became a, a kind of free-for-all. And, and with a plan now in place, we at least have the ability to um, lay out the various opportunities. There's still, though, the, the very public and political process of uh, identifying which entities and projects that come forward so, to, for support are going to receive that. And, and I think that's just an, an, an ongoing question of, of political will. Um, in our community, we still have that dynamic of, of downtown projects where there's more private development and we're working to seed that in other parts of the community from the public side. We have a responsibility to do that. Um, but we need that. Uh, we're working on our zoning code now. We, we need that in place so that we can actually begin to more uh, deliberately and intentionally guide that redevelopment into the places where we believe it both has the, the uh, where it matches the community's aspiration, but also has some, uh, some market base to it. Yes. I'd like to just uh, take a second and talk a little bit about the Port Authority in Cincinnati, because I think that the question... It's an, the question was about, I think, a capacity. How do you get this capacity? And just briefly, Cincinnati, we've had a number of organizations called Port Authorities, but, and they did nice things, but none of them had, like, the real horsepower for development. And then that changed. It, it, became, it was reconstituted. We worked very hard to get state legislation passed, which actually um, also established, allowed Cincinnati to establish a land bank. The Port Authority was put in charge of the land bank. And an organization, the Port Authority, that originally when it was revamped was the, the vision that the business community had and even the political community had was that this was going to be an organization that focused on taking brownfields and, and looking at industrial and commercial redevelopment opportunities. Well, 
As soon as it got wedded to the land bank, all of a sudden we realized that we finally had an organization that could aggressively deal with blight and abandonment in neighborhoods because under the Ohio law, um, as properties go to sheriff's sale, the Port Authority is first in line and they can wipe out all the liens.